be two years old. She hasn't been in the world long and doesn't know much. She hasn't much size. She may be, if she's good and plump, forty pounds in weight. As far as this world is concerned, she could disappear from it, and the world would never know that she'd gone, except for a few bleeding hearts back home. So there she is, lost on a mountain. Now that mountain weighs millions, perhaps billions of tons, and there are ores and minerals in it worth thousands of dollars. There's timber on it and animals roaming it. It's a beautiful, vast, and mighty thing, so mighty that we can stand in front of the mountain as the Jews did and find a whole Sinai. We're stunned by the immensity of it. And yet one little two-year-old girl weighing thirty-five or forty pounds is of more value than that mountain. The mountain has size, but that's all it has. It can't say mommy or daddy or now I lay me down to sleep. It can't kiss you or throw its chubby arms around your neck. It can't pray, it can't laugh, and it can't jump for joy. And it can't sleep relaxed and limp in its little bed at night. It lacks all that God values. The mountain has stability, strength, weight, mass, size, form, shape, and color. But it doesn't have a heart. And when God thinks about people, he thinks about hearts, not sizes. So we talk about God being high and lifted up, elevated, lofty, and transcendent. We think not about distance, for that doesn't matter. It's quality of being that matters. It's what makes the child valuable and the mountain not. The mountain has being, but not a high, transcendent quality of being. A little child has less being, but it has quality of being infinitely higher. You may find this hard to believe, but God is just as far above an archangel as he is above a caterpillar. You know what a caterpillar is. It's a little worm the size of your finger, with a fur coat. And, of course, it's not a very high-class thing. It's never been out in society. It doesn't amount to much. It's just a worm. And you have to watch it very carefully to know whether it's traveling east or west because it looks the same all the way around. That's a caterpillar. An archangel, on the other hand, is that holy creature that we see beside the sea of God, in the presence of God's throne. That mighty creature is a little higher than the angels, just as man was made for a time a little lower. That being can look upon the face of God with unveiled countenance. This is the archangel. It never was in sin, and no one knows how vast it might be. And yet God is just as far above that archangel as he is above the caterpillar. Why? Because both the archangel and the caterpillar are creatures, and God is the uncreated one who had no beginning, the self-existent one who was never created but who was simply God who made all things. The archangel is a creature. God had to put it together. God had to speak and say, Be, and it became what it is, a creature. It isn't God and never can become God, and God never can become it. There is a vast gulf, an all but infinite gulf, fixed between that which is God and that which is not God, between the great I Am and all created things, from the archangel down to the tiniest virus that cannot be seen with the naked eye. God made all that, and is just as high above one as the other. God's uncreated quality of life causes him to be transcendent, to rise high above all creatures. We have to be careful not to think of life in evolutionary terms, and even Christians are guilty of this at times. We think life begins with a cell, then becomes a fish, then a bird, then a beast, then a man, then an angel, then an archangel, a cherub, a seraph, and then God. That simply puts God on the top heap of a pyramid of creatures. And God isn't a creature. God is just as high above the seraph as he is above the cell, because God is God. God is of a substance wholly unique. But how can I go on? How can any man go on? How can I speak of that which escapes all human speech? How can I think about that which is above all thought? And how can I talk when silence would become me better? St. Augustine said, O oh God, when I would speak of thee, I can't. And yet if I did not, somebody must speak. And so he burst out and spoke. I wonder if some holy creature who has spent centuries looking upon the holy face of God ever listens to our speech. 
our vain and idle words, the chatter of earth's busy tribes of men, and the meaningless talk of the pulpits. How strange and how welcome such talk as this would be, though it would have no more relation to the high truth of it all than a two-year-old child playing a violin would have relation to fine music. And yet any father would smile if, in obedience to his suggestion, his little one took up the violin and tried to play. Any father who's away from his home knows what it is to get a letter written in block letters by a child in school, misspelled and run down the edge and all the rest. But it's a letter from home, from the little one that he loves very much. I suppose that this message about God's transcendence is far from being all that it ought to be or could be. And yet I think God is pleased because, compared with all the chatter of the world, it is at least an effort to talk about the Great and Holy One, high and lifted up. I wonder if some Holy One, some watcher who had spent centuries by the throne of God, if he came to earth and stepped into one of our pulpits, if he would be allowed to speak. I suppose that if he spoke here, he would say very little of what we usually hear. I suppose that he would charm our ears and fascinate our minds and cheer our hearts by his talk about God, the great God, the rapturous God, the one that gave his Son to die for us, the one in whose presence we expect to live while the ages roll. And I suppose that after we heard such a being speak about such a God, we would never consent again to hear a silly, timely sermon preached out of Time magazine. I imagine we would insist that anyone who dares to take up our time preaching to us should not try to settle the political or economic problems of the world, but would talk about God and God alone. We praise Thee, O God, we acknowledge Thee to be the Lord. All the earth doth worship Thee, the Father everlasting. To Thee all angels cry aloud, the heavens and all the powers therein. To thee cherubim and seraphim continually do cry, Holy, 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 Lord God of Sabbath. Heaven and earth are full of the majesty of thy glory. The glorious company of the apostles praise thee. The goodly fellowship of the prophets praise thee. The noble army of martyrs praise thee. The holy church throughout all the world doth acknowledge thee, the father of an infinite majesty. Thine honorable, true, and only Son, also the Holy Ghost, the Comforter. Thus sang our fathers in what is known as the Te Deum. We've forgotten it now, because we're not spiritually capable of understanding it. We want to hear talk that will tickle our ears. Now the holy man of God said, Lo, these are parts of his ways, but how little a portion is heard of him. Job chapter 26, verse 14. All that we can think or say is rational, but God rises above rationality. He rises as high above the rational as he does above the physical. God is of an essence and substance, the like of which nothing else exists in the universe. He is above it all, and yet we can know a little portion of God's ways. When I preach on the being of God, the attributes of God, when I talk about what God is like and what kind of God he is, I approach it respectfully from afar. I point with a reverent finger to the tall mountain peak which is God which rises infinitely above my power to comprehend. But that is only a little portion. The paths of his ways cannot be known. The rest is super-rational. I believe that we ought to get spiritual mysticism back into the church again. I believe that we ought to come back to the effort to walk and talk with God, to live in the presence of God. We have full gospel Christianity down until it's been programmed. Gifted and talented people and men with personality have taken over the holy place, and we've forgotten that we are here to worship God. God is the source and center and foundation of all. As the hymn says, How shall polluted mortals dare to sing thy glory or thy grace? Beneath thy feet we lie afar, and see but shadows of thy face. And even in our church services we can see only the shadows of God's face. For God transcends and rises so high above it all that the very angels in heaven veil their faces, and the living creatures cover their faces and cry, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Isaiah chapter 6, verses 2 through 3, Revelation chapter 4, verse 8. How terrible it is that in the presence of this awesome, awful God some people are untouched by it all. How frightful, how awesome, how awful it is. 
we don't want to hear about god we want to hear about something that can tickle our fancy that can satisfy our morbid curiosity or our longing after romance but the great god is there and we're going to have to face him now or face him then this mighty god like a great burning universe will burst upon us some day breaking down our defenses and destroying everything we've put up around ourselves and we'll have to deal with him and yet the average man isn't worried about it at all he sleeps well at night and thinks of his job and does it by day he eats sleeps lives breathes gets old and dies never having given a good high thought about the great god who transcends all this is a god about whom it is said thine o lord is the greatness and the power and the glory and the victory and the majesty for all that is in the heaven and in the earth is thine thine is the kingdom o lord and thou art exalted as head above all first chronicles chapter 29 verse 11 and yet we care so very very little about him how tragic it is that men will follow their lusts and pride living from money business appetite and ambition no additional proof needs to be given for the spiritual death that lies in the hearts of men she that liveth in pleasure is dead says the scripture while she liveth first timothy chapter 5 verse 6 and he that liveth in ambition lust appetite and pride who lives for money and fame is dead also though he may be young trim and athletic intelligent and well-to-do he is still dead and rotting in his death he is like a blind man who cannot see the sun rise because the great god rises above the horizon of his understanding and he doesn't know the sun has come up and like a worm in a cave or a toad under a rock he lives out his life and forgets that he's got to deal with god some day the great god almighty I live for that day when God will crash in upon me past my human understandings and every defense I might have put up that can also happen right now in this world that's partly what conversion is to be saved to repent to be forgiven of your sin to see a vision of God in your heart to see Jesus Christ on his cross and on his throne to be brought into the presence of this holy God you can go through the whole routine of the church and never have an experience at all like this you can learn to say god is love when you're a wee little thing you can get a bible for passing from one grade to another you can get big enough to make a speech in a sunday school program you can get old enough to sing in the choir join the church and be baptized you can teach a class entertain missionaries and learn to tithe giving of your money to the work of the lord you can be faithful and yet never have an experience of the great god breaking in upon your consciousness but living always once removed from god in the old testament when absalom returned from exile he went for two full years without ever seeing the king's face second samuel chapter 14 verse 28 and that's what happens in the churches but when god becomes real to us we are affected we are touched by what is called the mysterium tremendum a tremendous mystery that is god i just read this week that somebody said i never read tozer he's too negative well my brother before there can be any healing there has to be diagnosis when you go to see a doctor he can't just smile and look up from his coffee break and say take pill number nine maybe you don't need pill number nine maybe that'll kill you maybe what you need is to go under the knife you have to have diagnosis though sometimes i think diagnosis is worse than the disease i've had more trouble finding out what is wrong with me and sometimes finding it wasn't than i've had with the treatment what i preach may be negative i don't know if god the god who is high and lifted up whom i can love and worship and in whose presence i can live and pray and be with forever is negative give me a whole basket full of negatives the dread of god one thing that comes to us when we meet god is dread people don't like that they don't want to dread anything they want to go to church to be cheered up it's one of the silliest things i ever heard in my life 
I'd rather preach to twenty-five people upstairs over a barber shop than to a church full of people who give their money and ride me around in a limousine, but don't want me to embarrass them by talking about God. Concerning the dread of God, remember that Jacob said, How dreadful is this place! Genesis chapter 28, verse 17. And Peter said, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. Luke chapter 5, verse 8. Down through the years, wherever a man looked upon God, even dimly and briefly, it affected him terribly. And the dread I'm talking about is not physical danger. When you meet God, you get over the dangers and fears of this world. But the fear, the dread that is God, is not a sense of danger. It's a sense of being in the presence of someone very awful, very wonderful, transcendent and highly lifted up. It's a sense of creature consciousness. This was what Abraham expressed when he said, Behold, now I have taken upon me to speak unto the Lord, which am but dust and ashes. Genesis chapter 18, verse 27. If Abraham were in some of our gospel churches and heard somebody lead in prayer, he undoubtedly would be shocked at what he heard. He wasn't as fluent as we are. Sometimes I think our very fluency is from education, not from being near to God. We're just repeating what we've learned. We criticize Roman Catholics for reading out of prayer books, but at least what they read is good English. It is fluent and beautiful. We pray prayers that are just as embalmed as those prayers are, only we make them up as we go along. Those prayers are just as dead because there is no sense of creature consciousness. There is no feeling that I am in the presence of this great God before whom angels fold their wings and shut up their mouths, only to open them again and cry, Holy, Holy, Holy! That sense of creature consciousness, that sense of abasement, of being overwhelmed in the presence of that which is above all creatures, we ought to return to that again. I'd rather have a church of twenty-five people like that than twenty-five hundred that are simply there as religious socialites, meeting socially in the name of the Lord. They tell me that Martin Lloyd-Jones, one of the greatest English preachers of them all, once in a while travels all the way to Wales and gathers with twelve or fifteen people. There he recharges his batteries before he goes back to his great London pulpit, where he preaches to fifteen hundred or more people. But he wants to go up there. And he says, After I have been with those simple-hearted worshippers for a little while, I'm a better man, and I come back to London better prepared to preach. I believe that this is what we need in this hour. Another thing that comes to us when we meet God is a feeling of awful ignorance. There is a certain cult abroad, I'm not going to mention the name because I don't want to advertise it, that says we can answer any question there is in the Bible, and I have run into a lot of people that feel the same way. I think it was Cicero who said that some men would rather die than seem to be in doubt about anything. But the closer we come to God, the less we know, and the more we know, we don't know. I'm concerned about our flippancy these days. It is a terrible sin in the presence of a holy God. What if you and your friends were in the presence of the Queen of England and someone started trying to be funny by telling jokes about queens? How shameful, how horrible it would be! No one would do such a thing. And yet she's only a woman, a human being like you. How much more terrible that we can be so flippant in the presence of the great God who is Lord of all lords and King of all kings. We need to recover that feeling of ignorance. We know too much. There should be a speechless humility among us in the presence of the mystery inexpressible. When we meet God, we also have a sense of weakness. I don't think you will ever be strong until you know how utterly weak you are. And you will never know how utterly weak you are until you have stood in the presence of that great plenitude of strength, that great fullness of infinite power that we call God. When, for an awful, happy, terrible, wonderful moment, the eyes of our hearts have gazed upon the transcendent God, high and lifted up with His train filling the temple, then we will know how weak we are. God never works out of human strength. The strongest man is the weakest man in the kingdom of God, and the weakest the strongest. The holy apostle said, When I am weak, then am I strong. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 10. 
You can turn it around and say, when I am strong, whenever I feel that I can do it, then am I weak. I have been preaching since I was nineteen years old, and now I'm sixty-three, and yet after all these years of preaching I come into the pulpit shaking inside, not because I fear the people, but because I fear God. It's the fear and trembling of knowing that I stand to speak of God, and if I don't speak rightly about God, what a terrible error it will be. If I speak evilly of God, what a frightful crime! It is only when I speak well of God that I dare sleep at night without asking forgiveness. Weakness was what Daniel felt after he had been talked to by God. I set my face toward the ground, and I became dumb. There remained no strength in me, neither is there breath left in me. Daniel chapter 10, verse 15 and verse 17. That's the effect, self-depreciation and a sense of impurity. Isaiah said, Woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips. Isaiah chapter 6, verse 5. It is a feeling of absolute profaneness. You may say, Must I live all of my life in a state of dread, of ignorance, of weakness, of impurity? No. But you must arrive at that conviction about yourself and not just be told that by someone else. I grew up being taught that I was born in sin. They said, There is none righteous, no, not one. Romans chapter 3, verse 10. All our righteousnesses are as filthy rags. Isaiah chapter 64, verse 6. I believed it. And when I began to preach, I told other people, Your righteousnesses are filthy rags. But I thought their filthy rags were filthier than mine, that their sins were worse than mine. You can be as orthodox as John Calvin and believe in total depravity as much as any Baptist and still be proud and self-righteous. If you had asked a Pharisee, Are all men sinners? They would have said, Yes, except for us. And then they looked down upon the publican and the harlot. But Jesus looked down upon the Pharisee, for he knew that they were just as sinful. The Pharisee, who to his knowledge had never broken the law, was just as sinful as the harlot who had broken it every night. And yet is there anyone who has never broken the law? No, I didn't say that. I said that the Pharisee may have never consciously broken the law. If you strike a compromise with your own conscience, you can learn to look at yourself in the glass and see something better than is there. Old wise Aesop, who wrote so many great fables, told of a man who was walking with two bags tied together and thrown across his shoulder, one across his front and the other across his back. Those who met him asked, What is in those bags? Well, he said, In the rear bag are my faults, and in the front bag are my neighbor's faults. He had his neighbor's faults out in front of him where he could see them, but his own behind his back where he couldn't see them. This is how we live. But once we have been brought into the presence of God in true repentance, we will never again think of ourselves as good. We will never again think of ourselves as pure. We can only say, Lord, Thou knowest. That's all. And when God says to us, Son, are you pure? We can only say, the blood of Jesus Christ his Son cleanseth us from all sin. 1 John chapter 1, verse 7 We trust in what God said, though we feel as if we were the worst of all men. St. Teresa, that dear woman of God, said that the closer we are to God, the more conscious we are of how bad we are. Oh, the paradox, the mystery, the wonder of knowing that God, that transcendent one who is so high above all others that there is a gulf fixed that no one can cross, condescends to come and dwell among us. The God who was on the other side of that vast gap one day came and condensed himself into the womb of the Virgin, was born and walked among us. The baby that tramped around on the floor of Joseph's carpenter shop, that got in the way and played with the shavings, was the great God so infinitely lifted up and so transcendent that the archangels gaze upon him. There he was. I remember hearing a song many, many years ago that is antiphonal, sung responsively between two groups of singers. 
One man, who represents the sinner, sings, Which way shall I take? shouts the voice on the night. I'm a pilgrim, a wearied, and faint is my light. I seek for a palace that shines on the hill, but between us a stream lieth solemn and chill. He goes on to ask, How shall I bridge the gulf between me and the palace that I seek, knowing that I am so weak and he is so strong? I'm so bad and he is so good. I'm so ignorant and he is so wise. How can I bridge the gulf? And the other man speaks up and sings back, Near, near thee, my son, is the old wayside cross, like a grey friar cowled in lichen and moss. And its cross-beams will point to the far-distant strand that bridges the water so safely for man. A great gulf lies between me and the transcendent God, who is so high I cannot think of him, so lofty that I cannot speak of him, before whom I must fall down in trembling fear and adoration. I can't climb up to him. I can't soar in any man-made vehicle to him. I can't pray my way up to him. There is only one way. Near, near thee, my son, is that old wayside cross, and the cross bridges the gulf that separates God from man. That cross. God is transcendent. You'll never find him on your own. Muslims can search for him for a thousand years and not find him. Hindus can cut themselves and lie on beds of glass and walk through fire and not find him. Protestants can join churches and lodges and all other things and not find him. Philosophers can rise on rung after rung of thought and not find him. Poets can soar away on imagination and not find him. Musicians can compose heavenly music. When listening to Bach's Christmas Oratorio, I think to myself that such music never was on earth. And yet we can listen to that and enjoy it until it breaks our heart and not find him. Never, never find him. I must needs go home by the way of the cross. There's no other way but this. I shall ne'er get sight of the gates of light if the way of the cross I miss. The way of the cross leads home. So I offer you the cross. I offer you, first of all, that great God. Lost in thy greatness, Lord, I live, as in some gorgeous maze. Thy sea of unbegotten light blinds me, and yet I gaze. I point you to God, the Transcendent One, and then I point you to the cross. But you will never know the meaning nor the value of the cross until God, the Holy Ghost, has done something within you to break you down and destroy your pride, humble your stubbornness, change your mind about your own goodness, blast away your defenses and take away your weapons. He will do what the Quakers call meek you. He will cause you to come down, to become meek. What about you? You may be saved or half saved or badly and poorly saved. Perhaps you knew God wanted you, but you wandered away. You compromised with your business or your school, and now God seems so far away from you. And he is far away in one sense, but in another he is as near as your heartbeat, for the cross has bridged the gulf. Let the blood of Jesus cleanse us from all sin. He who is God the Transcendent One says, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. Matthew chapter 11, verses 28 through 29. Chapter 3 God's Eternalness For thus saith the High and Lofty One that inhabiteth eternity, whose name is Holy, I dwell in the high and holy place, with him also that is of a contrite and humble spirit, to revive the spirit of the humble, and to revive the heart of the contrite ones. Isaiah chapter 57 verse 15 Lord, thou hast been our dwelling place in all generations. Before the mountains were brought forth, or ever thou hadst formed the earth and the world, even from everlasting to everlasting thou art God. Psalm 90 verses 1 through 2 
I want to talk about something which everyone believes, but often without sufficient clarity and emphasis to make it worth their while. And if we can make the whole church see this truth and can rouse others to preach about it, 